Good afternoon to everybody. On Good behalf afternoon. of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it gives us immense pleasure to welcome you all. I can uh, see so many of you, all of you have come together and joined this initiative. It uh, really gives us a lot of boost. I can see my old friend uh, Partho Pratim Mojumdarda also joining. Thank you so much for carving our time from your busy schedule and joining so, uh, our program. This is an initiative of the chamber and that we have taken for the last few years as to promote the CSR concept as well as to be part of our corporate members in helping out them to reach the right kind of NGOs and also in the same way helping the NGOs to meet the right kind of uh, corporates. It's a matchmaking kind of a session where uh, initiative which we have taken from the chamber. And we have also launched a CSR portal, which you can access. The details and how to register can be shared by our colleagues later on once this session is over. But before that, I would like to welcome our today's speaker. We are very much thankful to Mr. Nishan Sena for giving us his time. And when we approached him as to, we wanted to know that what are the key USPs or key methods where an uh, NGO can do something different or how can we as a chamber handhold the NGOs and tell them how to draft a policy, sorry, a proposal or how to bring uh, the corporates on board. So Mr. Nishan Sina, who is heading CSR and yeah. exciting yeah. from his busy schedule and is addressing us today. I would request all participants who have joined here through Zoom to keep their audio on mute so that if you are talking or addressing any issue at your back end, it won't uh, disturb the program and we can um, take the program smoothly on. With this, on behalf of the chamber, on behalf of the CSR committee, I welcome Mr. Nishan Sina and request him to take the session forward. Over to you, Mr. Sina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sukanya, for the wonderful introduction and for inviting me today. Uh, I understand that most of my audience today are from civil society. And friends, I must tell you that I started my career with a civil society organization. And I identify myself more with civil society organization than with corporates. And when we were having this discussion with Sukanya that no, the chambers wanted to organize a session on handholding NGOs, I was wondering why should 
we do this. You know, for the basic fact that societies or trust, the philanthropic organization in India has a rich history you know, that dates back to uh, mid, -19, uh, mid 19th century. But then in 2014, something happened. And that was when the government of India and the Companies Act you know, also added provisions for PSR. And that changed the entire landscape of philanthropic approach in India. And uh, to be very precise, the corporates benefited from NGOs like in anything. So that was a time when, when NGOs handled corporates and now it's time for corporates to handle, you know, provide uh, related support or handhold the NGOs. So, uh, Arishay, can you please launch the pre presentation? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, as I said, Corporates benefited from the NGOs in certain ways in 2014, because when this company's act was enacted and provisions of CSR were, was added to the company's act, many of the corporates were in quandary, what to do about it, how to go about it. And that was the time when they adopted the C various CSR, various uh, developmental models that these NGO partners or you know, NGOs were implementing in India. And that is why we have seen that CSR in India has reached to a level where, which was not expected in 2014. So when, when we speak to CSR leaders today, the board directors or CSR committee members, the kind of language that you hear back from them was unheard of in corporate world. You know, you know, directors asking what what would be my impact, what is the social return on my investment. Nobody would have thought in 2014 that these are the these are the type of questions or opinion that uh, uh, board or CSR committee would be, you know, putting forth. But that is exactly what has happened. So we see that you know, the type of languages that corporates and civil society organization are now using in terms of CSR is almost aligned. I know uh, before I proceed further, let's dig deep and find how find out how the, this concept of Ghana charity philanthropy in India has evolved. You know, uh, this concept of Dan is deeply embedded in our society. You know, I was having a discussion with an uh, with a gentleman from civil society organization just the other week. And we were discussing on this, how this concept of dan, dharma, karma, how that, that has shaped Indian society. And he pointed, there's a very interesting remark that this gentleman made. He said that concept of dan, dharma, and karma that we speak about is almost as old as India itself. You take out any ancient Indian text and you'll find ample number of examples of you know, uh, importance that we gave to the concept of Tan. And there is, there is one interesting fact in this entire scheme of thing when we talk about ancient Indian uh, uh, you know, uh, belief on, in Dan and you know, dharm, concept of Dharma and Karma. That was so this all things centrifuged around the core theme of obligation or responsibility. Dan is an obligation. Dan is an ob is, a, is my responsibility. It's my dharma. That is how deeply uh, embedded uh, the concept of dan and dharma was in Indian society. When when Sang when he visited India during the reigns of uh, King Harshavardhan. 
He was astonished to note that 25% of the wealth the king used in welfare. He, he also noted that many of the temples and dharmsalas, the religious places, other sacred places, you know, they were adhering to the poor, most needy, needy sections of the society, feeding people in, who, were, who didn't have anything to feed upon. In Kerala, there was this concept of Athaza Pazdi Karandu that the landlords of Kerala used to you know, sound in the night, which, may, which means anyone left with supper. So, if you see the history of the India or uh, Indian culture, we'll find that once obviously that concept of Dan was deeply embedded in our society. And second, there was a specific way. So, you see landlords, kings making, uh, no, looking after the looking after the subject. So, it was more from the power center to the subject that the concept of charity was. So, uh, uh, this translated somewhere, I think, in mid, nine, uh, mid, mid of 19th century, when this entire concept of charity, philanthropy, or social uh, work started becoming institutionalized. When we had the first societies, trust, so when the first societies and trust started to emerge. Here, I'm trying to map out the, how CSR in India has emerged. And as you can see, I've already mentioned that in early years, the ancient period, this entire relation of welfare was between the king and his subject or the landlords and his subject. The first phase of CSR in India actually began with the industrial revolution somewhere in the middle of 19th century. Even at that time, if you see how CSR was done or what were the salient, salient features of CSR. One was obviously the corporates themselves were proprietary in, uh, entities or you know, entities owned by an individual. So CSR again, the entire concept of CSR during that period revolved around that individual, the owner. And whatever he used to do as charity was counted as CSR. And most of these were, were Towards religious activities like you no know, making donation to temples, dharmshala, feeding people. Those were the kind of uh, uh, philanthropic activity that corporates were engaged in. The phase two or the second stage of CSR uh, started to emerge during the freedom revolution of India. That was when Mahatma Gandhi uh, gave this famous, famous quotation for trusteeship. And if you can, if you see, the way CSR started was from the religious angle, but from the when it started to become the concept of trusteeship took the precedence. The kind of CSR activities and the stakeholders in CSR get started to diversify. So initially, it was just the owner. Then it became owner and the employees, and the kind of CSR that we were done were like construction of schools, uh, colleges, hospitals, research institutes that started to emerge during that period of 1910 uh, to 1950s. Then the third stage of uh, CSR appeared somewhere in 1960s in the mixed economy period, wherein the corporates required to have uh, uh, land and other resources from the society, and so the concept of CSR again evolved from, from core philanthropy to strategic community investment. Again, if you see, even in this phase, the core or the guiding principle of the, of the CSR uh, activities remained the corporate, the business interest. In 1990s, when India adopted the policies of globalization and opened economy, 
we realized that CSR, the way we use the corporate, used to do it won't work. And that is where CSR started to emerge as a tool for sustainable business practices. So it was the entire value chain, the entire stakeholder management that started to take precedence, the entire business operation started to take precedence, and that is how CSR emerged. In India, there was a fifth stage, there was a fifth stage of CSR, which is the mandatory CSR, which was again, as, a, as I've already told, talked about, the CS, enactment of CSR rules along with the company that 2014. Uh, in this slide, you'll see a couple of graphs of how CSR spent in India has emerged. I'm sorry if I'm 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 a bit fast. Please please do raise your hand and ask questions. So if you can see, I have not deliberately excluded 2014-15 because that was the initial year. So keeping it as, as benchmark won't be right. So we have started marking it from 2015-16 to 2021. And you can see that CSR spent in India has grown over this period and grown gradually and substantially. An important aspect of this was when we uh, when I was trying to find out how CSR is spent by PSUs and when PSUs has emerged, one thing was clear that the CSR spent from uh, from the PSU, although has grown, but has not grown as significantly as non PSUs because non PSUs the CSR spent almost doubled during this period. The second graph is more interesting than you would like to ponder. If you see the second graph, there are a few hints. Uh, you know, on how CSR is evolving in India. If we see line item, the second uh, second column is on education. So we can clearly see that education, the investment, social investment, investment in education has increased by almost twofold. Similarly, the, uh, there is a big leap in investment towards healthcare. Another important uh, theme that is emerging is rural development. And one, uh, one thing that you can see is uh, this column number 10, which is the Prime Minister Relief Fund. Although that jump is only for one year, and I believe that this is this was for the year 2020 uh, 20 and 21, wherein that mandatory provision for CSR was enacted, or no, if you if you if you have, if a corporate pays to invest in, C, in CSR, then they need to pump those money into some of one of the schedule seven funds described in schedule seven. That is what has led to that quantum jump. But what the general understanding is that this will not be the case going forward. The evolution, as you see, would continue in education, healthcare, rural development, obviously you see as is increasing, we, we foresee that invest, social investment in rural development will continue to grow. Well, then uh, it would be important to see how empowerment shapes up in the future because corporate's investment in empowerment hasn't grown that much. Uh, and another important aspect of uh, social investment is in env environment. Again, we haven't seen much much jump in that uh, segment, but we foresee that there would be an increase in social investment towards environment. We we'll go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So, the crux of this entire thing is, and I know I like to ponder back to 2014-15 when this act was enacted, uh, no, CSR provisions were enacted along with Companies Act. During the initial year when we were discussing with board directors or you know, CSR leaders, common theme that emerged was, no, we are investing in education, we are investing in health. We also want to do something on sports. We also wanted want to do something in heritage structure. We are, so the idea in the in initial year, the thought process in corporate world was that we will do everything that is listed in Schedule 7. But if we uh, reflect, this is the last slide that we have seen, the last uh, uh, graph that we have seen. We find that now corporates are doing this thematic prioritization. Every corporates are identifying what 
uh, what are the themes which they would like to invest upon? Second is, you know, uh, I've already talked about the kind of communication that we hear from CSR leader and directors is what are the impact, what, what are impacts, what are the numbers? So now more and more decision in CSR is you no know, backed by data. You have the, you know, the CSR leaders and directors, the committees and board, they want to make an informed decision on data, on uh, you know, giving back. What I term as give worldly, as you can see. So that this is how CSR has evolved and is going to, and it will continue to evolve. You know, 2020, 21, the government um, made some amendment and made impact assessment mandatory for CSR projects for one crore and above. But there are there are many corporates who are involving third party agencies to monitor their to, to understand the impact of their CSR project, even monitor the impact, monitor the progress of their CSR project. So that is not something which corporate world has not done. It's it's an organic thing that is that has been happening with the CSR sector. Go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, this is how the CSR sector in India has evolved. We like to uh, you know deliberate more on CSR rules and you know how the NGOs can approach uh, companies for CSR fundraising. One obviously when when we talk about uh, CSR fundraising or implementing a CSR project, first. And foremost thing for consideration is that every NGO, any and every NGO which is trying to approach it for CSR fund has to meet certain qualification criteria, which the government by their uh, amendment to CSR policy rules 2021 has enacted. So any corp, any entity which wants to see to implement a CSR project has to be a section eight company or a society or a trust registered under Section 12A or it, and 80G of Income Tax Act or under, sub, uh, under uh, 1023C, subsection 4, 5, 6, and 6A of Income Tax Act. Such entities should have an established track record of three years and should also be registered by filing with MCA, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, by filing CSR Form 1. So that unique CSR registration number that is generated becomes a mandatory parameter, uh, mandatory uh, thing for a, for any entity to become eligible to implement CSR. Now, if you go through the CSR provisions, CSR rules, and FAQs that the government has uh, circulated, the ways NGOs are implementing partner or civil society organization are being treated in CSR is that implementing agencies act as an extended arm of corporate. So, in terms of uh, in terms of legal obligations or legal in terms of legal purview, when a, when an entity when an NGO is in implementing a CSR project, they act on behalf of the corporate and are part of the corporate's function itself. And on in the other side, I have mentioned the Schedule Seven. This is a, a detailed list of all the activities that can be implemented under CSR, you know, education, healthcare, environment, heritage structure, uh, protection of um, uh, promotion of sports, disaster management, rural development. So these are elaborate lists already available in Google. So anyone wants to do look into it, you can definitely be Google and find out detail. Now this, these are the areas wherein we would like uh, you know, to ponder more on uh, this more related to approaching a CSR a corporate for CSR fundraising or CSR you know, you know, partnership. So my humble submission with all the CSOs is whenever we are approaching a corporate for a, for a, for a fundraising or for, for a partnership, we must approach it through the corporate spill. What are the expectations of corporates from CSR? Why should a corporate 
partner with any particular entities. We should be very clear on what's exactly, what is our USP, what is it that we are going to give to the corporate. And what is unique about my project, that the project that I have, I am planning. So, can, can we have some some uh, feedback from uh, from the uh, uh, participants? If we, if they can give us some of their opinions on this, please. In, 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 mention, give us a sense of what the Hello. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Mr. Chakraborty, can you hear me? Mr. Chakraborty, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chakraborty. Would the request you to forward your question? Yeah, uh, basically, is there any, any kind of guideline how to uh, basically identify a proper CSR partner? Suppose each and every corporates are having their own uh, agenda for supporting CSR activities, right? For the uh, financial year. So how to identify a proper uh, corporate, you know, to whom should I approach? Because we are working on uh, waste management and uh, environment. So how to approach a proper uh, corporate? Well, the agenda has to be matched. Right. In, in your question, if, if anyone else does that, you can see. I will cover that. Anybody else would like to ask anything? Yeah. Any more questions? Hello, am I audible? Yes. yes. Uh, I am calling from uh, GK ah. Trust, um, is a uh, national level NGO. Uh, I have the question, uh, which was uh, actually the question was put by uh, uh, Mr. Sena. Uh, the idea was this, uh, uh, there should be an expect, uh, uh, the NGO should match the expectation of a uh, uh, CSR partner or corporate. Now here, the question is this, uh, the answer would be the NGO who uh, they would be, uh, uh, the NGO who would be interested to uh, partner with uh, corporate uh, should offer his uh, their services which they are good at. That's most important, which they are good at. So as far as uh, JK Trust is concerned, we are uh, industry-driven, uh, very big NGO for, for 30 years. We have been doing in rural development uh, by developing development of paravets in tribals and women. Absolutely in, in, in the uh, far um, uh, distant localities of uh, towns and cities. So this is somewhere we have been doing it. That is one area. The other one is the skill development, okay. Raymond, uh, Raymond Terroring, where um, women empowerment is met by uh, um, livelihood of options given. So it was given to you, but done in Bengal, it was done in Nagaland, Northeast, everywhere. So the, the idea is this, that which we are good at, we should offer. And it should be matching the requirement of uh, uh, CSR uh, funding agency. Am I right? Is it that the way we should look at? Otherwise, go, uh, without uh, going for anything or a for any purpose, that's no, uh, that's actually not, uh, not uh, would not take care of the uh, you know CSR assessment as far as uh, your social impact is concerned. That is my point. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Park and Mr. Adi. We have seen what I've written here is whenever we are approaching a corporate for a for a partnership or for CSR pen, lots of homework needs to be done. Many a times you feel like you go unprepared and then Many of those things, they go unprepared and then with, with a generic document, it doesn't serve our purpose. The, on the left side, if you see the picture, there is a misalignment. So we cannot have a misaligned partnership. If the partnership has to happen, it has to happen so in alignment with what the civil society organization has to offer and what the CSR entity wants to implement. So in terms of alignment, we wanted to ask me, uh, the idea is to have a geographic alignment first. Because if I want to implement a project in, say, the mm -hmm. district of West Bengal, I would like to have a civil society partner or, a, or an implementing partner which has already uh, proven presence in the mm -hmm. district rather than paragraphing a partner from some other part of the state to mm -hmm. So when we are when a call, when a uh, when a CSR uh, an implementing partner is approaching for a CSR funding, we should have a clear understanding of which geography, which location we want to implement that project in. Number one, we identify who are the corporates who are active in the district geography. Number two. Then it comes to the thematic alignment because if I want to do a sports project in Purulia, I will have to find out corporate part, corporates who, come, who are uh, who have prioritized sports as a theme, and therefore there is a potential of partnership with that corporate. So that is another important consideration that we uh, that the implementing NGO must take into consideration before approaching a corporate. Both is the timeline. If you see the CSR rules, the way they have been amended, yes, the provision is for an ongoing project. But if you see generally how the CSR projects are being implemented, most of the projects are implemented for one year. And then you know, every year, based on the impact, it will be uh, a new project is good enough uh, to supplement the impact of the previous financial year. So timeline is important. You cannot have a multi-year timeline time until and unless the corporate approaches the CSR in that way. So if there are certain corporates who will be funding multi-year projects, but majority of the corporates, as I see, are still implement are implementing single-year projects. That is one. And above all, what matters is that. So if I go uh, as an entity, as a civil society organization, if I'm uh, approaching a corporate tax CSR funding, I have to be very clear on what are the impact that I will be, that my project will be delivering to, at the end of the project. Until and unless our project is backed by a data, it becomes a very, it becomes a two time exercise at the end of the day. So go to the next slide. So again, uh, this is in continuation to uh, my previous slide. But build a strong case for your organization. When you if you are done your homework, you understand that this is my strength. These are the questions I want to work with. These are the corporates who can fund my project. And if you approach them through that way, then it, it uh, the chances are more that the funding, you can get a funding. Second is when, whenever we are writing a proposal, we, we need to be very specific. Many of the many of the implementing agencies they just write a very generic sort of a proposal. There are entities, in fact, who just print one one sheet of paper and mail it to everyone. Those kind of approaches be avoided if if you have seen us. 
uh, not for uh, for fundraising, it's fundraising CSR uh, fund that for creating CSR partnership. So avoid being generic, very very specific, and back your credentials with authentic data. You know, um, um, it's very important that you know since now we already know that the directors and the CSR leaders, leaders across industries are now making a informed decision on CSR, it's very important that we provide them adequate, transparent, and authentic data to help them to come to a, come to a conclusion or to select a project. When I uh, when I talk, we talk about authentic data, what can be data sources? My impact of previous years, if I have a third party impact report or impact report even conducted by students from universities, that can be a very good source of uh, uh, data. Second is testimonials from my stakeholders, video testimonials would be a great source. And now, now it doesn't require a young source. You can just move your mobile phone, click a, make a small video, and make a video uh, with various applications available in, in, your, in, 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 in the system. So that is important. At the end of the day, what needs to be understood is CSR is no charity. No one is going to do charity. Now the board is asking, board of CSR committee, leadership, they are asking on the social return of investment on the impact of things. And as I, as I already mentioned, an implementing partner is an extend, extended arm of corporate, corporate in terms of CSR implementation. So the more clarity we have in terms of our project design, in terms of impact, and the more communication, I'll come to that point also. And the more communication we have with corporates, the chances are better that we'll get, uh, you know, uh, an NGO would be able to crack the CSR funding. So uh, these are some of the uh, recommended content of the proposal. But before I go into this, we need to understand that every corporate entity approaches CSR through a different angle. You know, some of the corporates, they prefer, and I think most of the corporates, they prefer initial contact with the concept note, one pager or two pager, two pager max, two, two and a half pager concept note on what exactly is the uh, implementing of this plan they are wanting to do. There are co uh, corporates who will have their formats for proposal submission, so there is a format. You can you need to have that format for proposal submission, but if there is not uh, no formats exist, then this is what is proposed. It starts with the project uh, project summary, a brief of the project concept in terms of the, uh, the compliance with Schedule Seven of the Companies Act, a uh, brief of what activities are are to be done, a brief of your uh, you know, budget. Then we go to the organization profile. Again, in organization profile, we have to link it with the, with the compliance perspective in terms of your legal status, your registration under Section 18 12A, MCA, CSR Form 1, PAN card, those details to incorporate in your organization profile. Help with, as uh, Mr. Parkman had mentioned, that geographic alignment is important. So, where exactly do we want to implement the project? And then it comes the meat of the project, the problem statement. What exactly do we want to do with this with, with, with the project? Well, if it's a say, if I want to do a drinking water project in, uh, in South 24 Pantanas of West Bengal, yeah. uh, my problem statement has to back. Uh, uh, the my final or my other my, my, uh, the, uh, the constant with data source like also against uh, South 24 Pardanas, you yeah. don't have access to tap drinking water. What, where is the data source that is available in website or in the from government source? What are the data source that have Whatever I need to come to that problem statement is very important. Either it be from so now one problem here is that an entity is on a specific problem that so this is what we are facing. But when we go so when you go to inquire with them on as to how the 
and that is still acceptable or okay if you are working, if you are publishing those data into in in, uh, in more domains or no anywhere. If it is public data, then it is very much acceptable. But if, if it is data which is created just for the sake of in the big question mark on its authenticity, that we need to take care of. So once we are clear with our problem statement. Minimum requirement is strategy. One thing that we are uh, not incorporated in and this is the concept of the project or the entire project design. How my project design is going to address the problem? So, if there are, uh, say, I have mentioned that you know, we want to do a drinking water project in South 24 Parvana because. 60% of household don't have access to spectrum distribution, which is reflected by government records. Then what? I'm install RO water, community based RO water filtration plants. Or I can do a tube build with the. With, with, um, so, whatever is my strategy to address those problems that we had identified at the inception, that is one project concept. Huh? And then, variables of the project to give me a spell of deliverables. You can take the case of the package in terms of deliverables, what can be deliverables of these projects? It's something that we highlight. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. Then the title of the chat box. Thanks everybody for the interaction so that the session can be beneficial for our lesson. So if you have anything to say, anybody, whether it is Dr. Ramanujan Shankar, anybody who wants to say something, please say. Yes, I can have a word now. Um, I have a question. This is Sumedha from Mani Deaf Children Foundation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, ma'am, audible. Thank you for a very wonderful session, sir. Uh, my question is regarding uh, geographical alignment. Uh, so when we say geographical alignment, uh, how does a corporate define geographical alignment? Is it the uh, offices where the corporate is located 
or the clients are located or how do we define geographical alignment like how does a corporate define geographical alignment that's one question and uh, i'll just ask the second question as well my second question is about impact uh, when we talk about impact impact itself is a very broad term you know impact cannot happen in one year or two years uh, you are from that sector so you will definitely agree that it takes five six years and more than that also to show real impact so how do we actually put forward impact in proposals you know how do we show the real outcomes which corporates would agree to and we can align so these are my two questions thank you no problem uh, good questions. That is okay. No, 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 some new uh, equals on the Thank you, Ashish. So, um, you know, when this company CSR rules along with the company right was enacted, one of the provision was that CSR activities should be implemented. It was not a, a bonding per se, but it was a, to the corporates that CSR activities should be implemented in local area, mm -hmm. right? And it, 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 was, it was quite relevant for the corporates. No, right. you, you see from your own perspective and you know, as an individual, if I want to do something, I would rather do something within my area of uh, interest so that number one is I can monitor what is happening. Number two is delivering which I am operating, they get a visibility of uh, what I am doing. And number three would create a goodwill for the company. That is how this concept of geography, I mean, geography was, uh, geography has happened. And when I talk about geographical alignment, the idea is that you know, every corporate, if you see, they will have a certain, they will be implementing CSR projects in a certain geography. You go to their, uh, uh, CSR reports and you'll find that every corporate will have a will have a certain uh, district. I'm, I'm not talking about the big corporates because th there are corporates which are implementing projects pan India and you can definitely approach them. But then there are the mid segment corporate who would mostly be implementing projects which are very which is near to their uh, plants. So. So if, if there are plants or factories or establishment, so that understanding we need to do. That research has to happen first, number one. Your second question was on impact, and I agree with you that no, it's not something that you can show overnight. The problem here is that when we uh, when we talk about project, we don't even reflect on the output output side. We, we and reflecting on the output, input and output, which is not the end. At least the outcome part of my, my CSR project or my developmental project must reflect in my do document. So when I say about uh, you know, drinking water project in, uh, in any region and I install tube wells, at the end of the day, you know, installing 50 tube wells or 100 tube wells with no impact or that, that uh, you know, installation alone will not help me get any uh, no, give me any confirm uh, uh, sense of uh, you know uh, relief in terms of my whether my uh, funding has been utilized properly or not. What will give me a, a comfort is that at least thousand households are getting access to, to safe drinking water through the tube wells that we have installed or through the hand pumps or whatever we have done. So that data can definitely happen in one year. Then. Why it is important, I, I talked about communication is even if, you, if a corporate has stopped funding, you keep on reporting what good things have happened from your CSR project. Five years down the line, we find that the uh, number of I mean, incidents of communicable disease in the villages have decreased because of that water project. 
let's report it to corporate let that communication with the corporate all, uh, happen always now that is where many a times we fail so that is my submission that no uh, i know impact is not something that can be showcased in a year or even in two years now the government mandates it uh, to be done in the next financial year next year only but then at least the out outcome of a, of the investment if that is also you no know, reported that that will go a long way in supporting your case i can go back to the okay. so yeah we were in this slide of smart deliverables now we have already del delivered and um, means we have already discussed and i have specifically mentioned here is outcomes and not impact specific measurable achievable realistic and time bound outcomes of our csr in of your csr investment next slide now a few important things that every corporate will want one is sustainability of impact of a project and a clear strategy for corporate when they take a decision on 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 a specific project they'll want it want to fund it or support the initiative for for a specific period maybe 2 years 3 years and then withdraw from the project so that comfort that you no know, once this this project is implemented for 3 years you will have a clear exit strategy for corporate is very important you know i'll give you example i was having a deliberation with a with, with a corporate um, uh, csr leader 2 uh, 3 days back in mumbai so they have donated a school bus to a, to a school you know, which was run by a foundation now they they are they are running into troubles in operating the school bus they gave, gave the car capex but now the operational part of the bus is not full, fulfilled by the foundation or for, by the school not to blame anyone because you know both both the both the foundation and the corporate didn't discuss it this up front and that's why this problem is happen, has happened so this kind of problem can be avoided once we have a clear cut exit strategy or you no know, how how we will make a project and initiative sustainable that is an important consideration for cs uh, for corporate and previous experience previous exp impact i have already mentioned that you no know, your credentials ma matters and the last would be the deta detailed budget with rational for each budget element now again here you see uh, there when we talk about detailed budget it should be detailed enough so that you no know, we have adequate clarity on each budget line, line items and there is that gives a comfort to corporates as to where the where exactly is the uh, is fund fund will be utilized so these are the some of the, uh, these are some of the content of the proposal that is recommended obviously it needs to be tweaked between corporate to corporate some corporates also ask for logical framework matrix um, you know you can which can be submitted if the corporates don't ask for a logical framework kind of logical framework is uh, will take will consume lots of time in this uh, you know designing so if if uh, corporate demands for a logical framework you can go ahead and uh, do that otherwise you can continue with these as uh, the proposal content content of a proposal now um, before i can uh, conclude my part of this thing and uh, open this forum for questions you know some of some considerations we always need to keep in mind so even once a csr project is mobilized it's the communication from the from the implementing partner or from the civil society organization to corporate has to be continuous and many a times you feel like you know the reports reporting and all i know for, for when you are in the, into the implementation and those at the grassroots level at the field level they find it a bit problematic in reporting but then uh, as i uh, mentioned earlier so, uh, the ngo partners act as an extended arm of civil, of the of the csr of, of the corporate so it's very important that a continuous flow of information from the implementing partner 
to the corporate happens so that corporates are aware about what is happening in my project, what good is happening in my project, and they, they are able to take a decision next year. Many, no, so this communication has to happen on a continuous basis. Second is engagement of uh, the leadership of the NGO with the corporate. So this again has to be continued. There has to be a continuous dialogue between the two so that you know, the tool, uh, this is a, the leadership level at the leadership level. We are on the same page. This is important. And when I talk about communication, uh, you know, I, I, I have come, come across ample of example of some great work done by civil society organization, which never got reported. Which never got documented and never got reported, and that is where the frustration of corporate will start. You know, uh, I have experience of uh, of a project wherein more than thousand lives were impacted, like anything. But we, we, this, we this, as a corporate, we received no information, and it was only when we visited the field that we realized that kind of impact that we are doing. This was a project which we did in uh, Mumbai called Nalpani Yojana, wherein we were trying, we were fetching water from the foothills to uh, to the uh, hilltops where the uh, you know, habitations were for the, of the tribal population. And uh, you know, when we visited this, we found that uh, before the project, every woman, each one lady from each household used to walk down, down still, down, uh, downhill and uphill to fetch water at least four times a day. That distance was around three kilometers one side, so almost six kilometers for one round. So imagine 24 kilometers. When we tried to you know, quantify it, we found that one woman walks 6,000 kilometer in a year. That was that is the aerial distance between Mumbai to London. Six thousand kilometer in a year just to fetch water. A very small initiative with a small funding of around seven eight lakhs, creating such an impact. But at the end of the day, you know, a wonderful project, not properly documented. You no, know, it was. We were fortunate that we visited, but if the corporate or you know, someone did, does not visit them and does not do this calculation, then uh, as an NGO, we fail the entire system. And that is where we come to the uh, importance of MIS with, with NGOs. You know, whenever we talk about talk with civil society organizations and NGO partners, the only the one problem that they will uh, will always find is weakness in documentation and MIS systems. Now, my whatever I say, and I have already mentioned that data points are very important when we, uh, when we talk about CSA. Now, if I make a statement in my project, but if I'm not able to validate it, back it up by data, then that's a big statement. No, I, I, I'm again recalling one incident uh, that happened with, my, with me in a project in Mumbai. So there's this organization, quite big organization, not a small organization. So they have pan-India presence. And they do a lot, lots of station in uh, on financial literacy. So in one such program, they said 80% of uh, our participants, after hearing uh, the, the, after getting the training on financial literacy, start mobilized some schemes from the government. So when we asked, wow, where, where are the proof? What is the mean, means for or means of verification? You say, no, sir, we have inquired with everyone. They have reported that they have opened uh, Janadhan account. They have started this uh, uh, insurance scheme or something else. Where is the proof? Nowadays, creating a proof is just taking a picture. Take a picture of their Janadhan account ka passbook, document it, that's it. Even if you if 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 if, a, if your data validation point is in crude form, it is there. That has to be there. 
if we if we don't back our data with adequate uh, proof then the authenticity of data is a big question mark and then you know that will obviously impact the funding decision so uh, these are my submissions for today i'll you know um, welcome any questions suggestions from the audience please If anyone want to ask any question, you are most welcome. Hi, uh, if uh, we have, we want to uh, so, um, present our case study to you, uh, what is the best uh, possible way to go about it? If okay. may I ask. So we would request you to introduce yourself and also uh, repeat the question once more. Yeah, uh, myself, uh, Rajiv, I am the founder of Karma Moksha Nirvana Foundation. Uh, basically, uh, we are working on this uh, waste management, like uh, we are converting used abandoned clothes from the household and uh, we are uh, manufacturing reusable, sustainable, durable and fashionable uh, carry bags, uh, which is an alternative solution for one-time use plastic carry bag. And, and if we talk about our impact story that uh, at present, the production capacity is 5,000 rag bags per month. And uh, we are actually uh, redu re reducing around uh, 150,000 mm -hmm. carbon footprint emission in a month and generating livelihood for 51 families, BPL community families. Apart from that, uh, basically this initiative is uh, delaying the process of textile waste going to the land, landfill. So we are basically uh, working on the circular economy as well as we are addressing 11 SDGs. Now, uh, if we uh, want to connect with you and present our case study for consideration it, it is not that impaired, impaired that uh, you have to go, go about it, but still for a, any kind of suggestion or any kind of feedback on that. So what is the best way to go about it? Uh, you, you can connect uh, You can connect with the Bengal Chamber and uh, they will share my email ID with you and you can definitely connect with them. Yeah, we have already been conferred with a UN seed grant for this particular project. I just Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question. Hi, this is Sushmita. I'm um, joining from Pune and we run an organization called Pencilwix Foundation. We're a three-year-old organization. We work on financial literacy and numeracy, sorry, foundational literacy and numeracy uh, along with life skills integrated inside government schools. Um, so one, I think we are just starting off with the CSRs this year, and I really wanted to know uh, what is the best way to identify, uh, you know, because already there's a lot of people, a lot of corporations already doing CSRs. Is there any way to identify the new uh, corporates who are getting into CSR or how do we identify the, you know, the corporates in the particular region or locality? Uh, I don't know if you have heard about this national CSR portal. Okay. No, so, I haven't. Portal is an in initiative of Ministry of Corporate Affairs, wherein okay. uh, lots of data related to CSR spend, CSR thematic area wise spend, company wise spend, that is populated by the ministry. So you can go to that portal. You'll find quite quite a number of relevant information for you. Okay. Thanks. That is helpful. Uh, Mr. Sina, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Sina, this is P.P. Uh, Masundar from JK Trust. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so wonderful deliberation, sir. We are uh, having few questions. And all, uh, as far as I am concerned, all, most of the questions have been answered. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very clarity uh, we have received from your deliberation. And it was a wonderful program. Personally speaking, one thing that uh, in terms of my experience with CSR activities and socio-economic uh, social uh, projects, 
we have seen that our even our bengal chamber has a wonderful activity a lot of people do not know wonderful activity they have done so uh, they have made something unique that uh, in women empowerment it has been a milestone so my idea goes that as far as your organizations case uh, or objectives are concerned so uh, since it's actually headquartered in calcutta if i'm not wrong then uh, the csr man there is a word called command areas in csr command areas as a uh, coal india takes care of only collieries they say that talk, uh, take care of the collieries are all command areas so it's a uh, headquarter in calcutta but it's a pan india presence you have so do you have any command area in terms of csr where we can focus on these areas and made our model uh, matching with the uh, requirement of that particular area if in orissa or uh, some other bombay or so anything like that command area type uh, we do have identified geographies and identified themes prioritized themes for csr i'll suggest you go visit our website lots of details you will find in terms of our prioritized uh, thematic priorities and geographies wherein we are implementing so basically our command area is around our plants which are again you no know, as you as you have already mentioned we are pan india so it's spread out across india so okay. across all near all our factories we will have certain csr activities happening very fine very fine actually that was my question because i have when i made this uh, even we, i was interested to work in sundarban and coal india people said no coal are there so we are not going there you take care of raniga and shijar sudati than that so that was the idea i had uh, in my mind definitely will look into your website to understand Oh, what are your location area locational areas and how we can service the people of that particular locations absolutely thank you thank you very much thank you i would request mr dr banerji if he has to say something If we don't have any other questions, then we can conclude today's session. So I have a question, sir. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, sir, this is Mrituja Bhattacharya. I'm from uh, the NGO called Cause for Change. I we are based out of Jharkhand, and okay. uh, sir, we are almost a uh, ten years old NGO. Uh, we haven't uh, applied for any uh, you know CSR fund yet. Uh, do you think like you know someone need to have a sufficient uh, you know turn turnover or something like uh, like you know in good numbers in the balance sheet to get csr fund like in in such government funds they have some cap limit like one has to have you know 1 crore or some something like that so is that uh, mandate in csrs i mean how do companies see the balance sheet of any ngo before you know delivering the project to the end user mrityunjay yes. yes sir good good question look um, uh, from a cor corporate perspective if i speak i don't we don't actually look into balance sheet to decide on the funding number one mm -hmm. so that that doesn't have a bearing having said that we do look into the financial capabilities of the organization for to decide the quantum of fund so if your funding previous year funding is 8 10 lakhs and a corp and you are approaching a corporate with a funding you know, in the, in that bracket i think you will you won't you won't face a problem but if you have a funding of you no know, balance sheet is of 8 10 lakhs turnover and you are asking for a fund of you know, 50 lakhs or you know crore then that becomes a problem so right. based on financial turnovers the best part is to design a project according to the uh, financial capabilities of the organization all right sir uh, can i ask you another question sir please go ahead 
All right, uh, sir, um, is there any uh, boundary jurisdiction if we are uh, based out of Jharkhand, can we uh, work for any organization based out of uh, Delhi or some other part of the country? So you, you are representing a society or a trust? Society, sir. And what is your article of association? Uh, so what does your article of association say? What is your geography? Uh, we have uh, mentioned in the article of association that we can work in pan-India basis. So you can work in pan-India in that case because for a corporate it doesn't matter. But right. you will have a proven experience of working in that particular geography wherein you want to mobilize CSR fund. All right, sir. Thank you so much. So, Ms. Sushmita, yes, thank you so much for being this. This was very helpful, especially in the examples here. Thank you, Ms. Sushmita. Is there anyone else? Ms. Mehta says, uh, what a wonderful session. Thank you so much for this session. Thank you. So, do we conclude? Yeah, if we don't have a question, then we can... Uh, yeah. Anybody else would like to ask any question? I would just like to... I'm Snigda from SVP. I'd just like to thank uh, Nishant uh, very much for doing this. Uh, we did pass it on to many of our NGO partners and I saw that many of them attended the call. So thank you very much, Nishant. Thank you, Sita. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sina. And thank you, Bengal Chamber, for this wonderful session. Thanks a lot. It is insightful. Thank you, everyone. So we can conclude. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session. Everyone who are asking for Mrs. Sinha's email ID, you may con contact with Bengal Chamber. We'll share that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.